we have now and, and uh, inability to sometimes get out and go to events. It's uh, great to have something that you can kind of schedule in and attend from wherever you're at. I'm attending from my house, uh, so that works out really good. So, um, so yeah, what I want to talk about today is a little bit about tips and tricks for selling quality, uh, creating buying and developing uh, great teams. So I'm just going to quickly chat a little bit about who I am. Um, Norval talked a little bit about me, but I just wanted to touch base of who I am. So I'm the Continuous Improved Manager, and CSAT is our customer survey for Staples Business Advantage Canada. I'm sure most of you have heard of Staples. Uh, we um, at Staples Business Advantage, slightly different. We're the business-to-business -business arm of Staples, so don't really have anything to do with the retail stores per se, other than buying uh, school supplies for my daughter. Uh, at Staples, but other than that, uh, we do the business to business side, and I'm responsible for that across Canada. I've been in the manufacturing field for about 10 years, uh, moved uh, from manufacturing to the service or distribution field with Staples. Uh, been uh, 10 years here, it's uh, been a good company, so pretty happy with it. Uh, I'm an ISO 9 and 14,000 trainer and auditor. Uh, I have Staples Business Advantage Canada is ISO 9000 and 14000 certified, so I'm involved in that quite he heavily. Uh, core Health and Safety Certified Auditor, so I I'm not sure how familiar some of you might be with Core, but it is, uh, I call it ISO for Health and Safety. Uh, and I'm a Certified Six Sigma Black Belt from ASQ. Um, as Norval said, I am the past chair of the ASQ Vancouver section. Our section has about 400-ish uh, people uh, in our section, so quite a large section. Uh, was chair for, boy, four years? No, yeah, at least four years. Uh, so great, great association, very happy uh, with ASQ and if, if it's your first time kind of getting involved with ASQ or, or seeing it, I definitely encourage you to, to see what uh, is involved with it. Uh, it's a great networking, great way to get more information about quality and, and like-minded people who are in the quality professional field. I'm also the owner of a consulting company called InControl Consulting. And I'm a Pisces, I'm addicted to my Xbox and I actually can actually play it and I enjoy long walks in the park. So now you know a little bit about me, let's dive into the content of the whole uh, meeting. So I think one of the big things I always find is when I'm out and I'm talking to folks and, and networking and, and that sort of thing, you know, the one thing they always come up with is, you know, how do we get buy-in from management? How do we get management to kind of listen? How do we get people to listen? You know, being in the quality management field and being an auditor or going in and trying to improve somebody's area, a lot of people don't like you, you know, stepping into their sandbox. A lot of people don't, uh, you know, kind of know why you're there. Uh, people kind of see maybe you're coming in to try to change things up, make things different. Nobody likes change, so that's even harder. So we want to kind of get folks to kind of get that buy-in and kind of understand why is this important and get them to go sort of go in the right direction and maybe even be a booster for us and say, hey, this, this really worked out well. Uh, you know, we should listen to this guy or girl and, and do some of the things that they're talking about. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that. I don't have a lot of time and I want to save some time at the end for questions, but, uh, you know, I'll give a kind of a high level and I can always answer any questions afterwards uh, or uh, offline. So how did we create buy-in in one easy lesson? Well, to me, it is all about learning to sell. Uh, if you remember the movie Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, I liked his little ABC, always be closing. Uh, we kind of have to think that way, I think, as quality management professionals. I think we have to think, how do we sell our message? How do we get people to understand, you know, this is, this is why it's important and, and, and get them to be uh, on the bus and, and, and helping us out. But we need to, to sell. We need to sell the information. A lot of times we think, well, gee, you know, they, they should just know that. You know, I'm showing them improvement. I'm showing that this is going to get better. Yes, true. But everybody has different motivators. Everybody has different things that are moving them in a direction. So we need to learn how to understand that, capitalize on it, and then present it in a way that they're going to be excited. And they're going to say, yeah, this, this makes sense. And this has value. And, and this helps me or my department or my business uh, in a tangible way that is going to make a difference. So learning to sell to me comes into three different areas. One is understanding your audience. Okay? And I think that's really important. Uh, you really need to understand your audience, really know, you know, who am I talking to? What is their background? What, what are they involved with? Find the key driver that is going to motivate them. Okay? Different people have different drivers. We, we need to kind of uncover that. That's part of 
sort of the sales process of, of looking at it and saying, you know, not everybody's the same. Everybody has different things and different uh, ideas that are going to sell them. You know, just when you go to buy something, you know, you may be interested because you like the color of it. Somebody else is interested because the price is good. Somebody else is interested because the reputation of the company is good. So everybody has those different reasons and different uh, drivers for buying something. And I think one of the biggest ones is crafting your message. Um, you know, making sure that that the message is crafted to the right uh, driver, the right audience, but also crafted in a way that people can understand it and people are going to go, oh, okay, I, I see what that is. Um, so I, I think those three really help you uh, sell that message and get people to create that buy-in and, and get them to understand why it's important and get them to be, um, you know, messengers of, of that, that message that you're trying to create to everybody else uh, in the company and saying, this is a great idea, we should all jump in on this. So the first one is understanding your audience. And I, I kind of like this, this imagery because I think it's, it's quite uh, interesting, you know, what you want to say, what they're interested in, and then that little bit is actually the relevance of how they're going to stay connected and, and they're going to be paying attention and not be like this guy where he's falling asleep um, and not be this person who's going to be extremely frustrated because you're trying to tell them everything, give them all the information, but they're not listening because we're not giving them what's relevant uh, to them. So. So to me, when you're understanding the audience, you have to have some insight into your audience if you're going to find their driver. Because, like I said, different things motivate different people. Uh, different departments have different business goals. So we need to really understand, you know, who are we talking to? What are we trying to find? How are we trying to get them to understand the message? So you need to find those and decide how best to create your message. Because one size isn't going to fit all. You can't talk to the guy on the plant floor the same way you're going to talk to maybe his supervisor or how you're going to talk to the executive team or uh, you know everybody has that that different uh, expectation different ideas and one of the things that I found is really helpful is this chart on the bottom that kind of talks about demographics demographics and psychographics uh, and I think these are two kind of good things to kind of keep in mind when you're talking to folks and kind of understanding you know uh, how can I understand my audience you know, you want to look at age, education level, gender, income level, geographic region, cultural, ethnic, ethnic background. All of those things are going to give you a little bit of insight into the, the person and an insight into how do you uh, find what motivates them. How do you find out what their goals? How do you find out uh, a message that's going to connect with them? Uh, you know, I have a great example of that when I was talking to uh, one of the gentlemen that used to report to me. Uh, he was um, from China. And he said, you know, he was having a bit of a, a tough time fitting in. And, and I thought it was a great example because he said, you know, when, when the guys come in, they come in, we're in Canada. We talk about hockey all the time. Hockey and the weather, I think, is what we talk about all the time. So he would say, you know, when the guys come in and they want to talk about hockey and they're talking about hockey, he said, and I can't get into that. He said, but if you went and talked about soccer or football, as they call it in Europe, he said, I, I'd be all over that. I would know exactly what, what they're talking about. I'd be able to tell you the stats of, like, all the different teams, all the, the great players, all of that sort of stuff. So you need to find that connection, and, and people are a lot like that. You know, you're talking hockey to them, and they are looking to, to understand soccer. So you need to understand, you know, some of that uh, information in there. Then tie that into the second part of their attitudes, their beliefs, their values, their loyalties, their knowledge level, their lifestyle. All of those things are going to kind of get you to have a better understanding of your audience and a better understanding of you know, what's going to motivate them or what's going to get them to listen to my message or how can I – craft my message that's going to hit them on the level that they understand uh, and that they can get excited about and they can be part of uh, solving that problem. So next is finding that key driver. Okay, a lot of times for us in the in quantum management field, we, we kind of look at quality or improvement or, you know, those sorts of things. And, and yes, true, that that is important. But again, that's not the same driver, the same message for everybody. You know, some people, just like this, this chart shows, increased agility, higher service levels, reduced complexity, cost reduction, all of those can be really important things. But if I was to bring this to a salesperson and say, my continuous improvement efforts can help you with this, they would kind of say, well, what does that do for me? Because those are great, but I'm a salesperson and I'm all about improving sales. So how does this improve sales? And that's what I would have to really kind of show them and say, 
well, this is, you know, if we do this, then it's going to help you retain more customers or it's going to help you gain a new market. Or if we support ISO certification in 9014, you know, this market you couldn't get into before, that's the market you're going to be able to get into. So you can't assume that common purpose. Yes, a lot of the people that you're going to be talking to work for the same company. They probably have the same higher level goals, but everybody has a specific pain point to their area. And, and that's kind of what you need to find. You just say, okay, what, what is that pain point to them? Um, you know, one of the examples I can use is uh, I wanted to start 5S in the company I was at before, in the manufacturing company. And I knew if I went out into the plant floor and just started telling those guys you need to do 5S, this is what 5S stands for, the blah, 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 got them into a meeting, which would be hard enough to do in the first place to get them off the floor and put them in a meeting to, to train them on 5S and all that stuff. I wouldn't have had the buy-in and it would have been a very tough slog to get through. So what I did instead was uh, I went and I t saw one of the, the main guys that was there, has been there a long time, hates change, doesn't like change, most most um, vocal person against change. I said, if I can change his mindset, he's going to change everybody else's mindset. Or I can use him as an example and say, look, if he's excited about it, you guys should be excited about it. So I went to the machine, I talked to him, I talked to him at his workstation, I didn't bring him into my office, I didn't bring him into somewhere, I went and talked to him, and I asked him, what's your pain point, what, what bugs you about your job, what, what's tough in your job? And the first thing he said was, you really want to know, and I'm like, yeah, you, you do the work, so of course I want to know, and he said, nobody ever asks me, he said, people just tell me what I have to do, but he said, nobody ever asks me what my challenges are. So I talked to him about it and he said, you know, one of the, the challenge, some of the challenges he has is my tools are never here. My equipment's not in the right place. You know, I, I have to set all this stuff up in the morning. I have to go find it. Uh, you know, my boss gets angry at me because I'm not running the machine. And I said, hey, got something great that would work for you. It's a little system called 5S. Why don't we walk through it? And we walked through it. I, I helped him. He was excited. He participated in setting it up. And once we had it all set up, he was beaming with pride about his workstation and would tell everybody else how it was. His stats went up because everything was there and he could get started right away. And it made it much easier for me to move that 5S process through the rest of the plant because everybody saw that it was working so well for him. So I find one of the biggest things is asking. Don't assume that you know what somebody's key driver is just because they work in operations or just because they work in supply chain or just because they're in a sales area. You know, use questions and then really listen. Use that, that term that's really uh, out right now is, you know, active listening. Really, really listen to what they're saying. Ask them, what's your biggest inhibitor to part, departmental growth? You know, what's your biggest hairball? What does your boss obsess about? Because that's going to be what they're going to be obsessing about. And if they can help their boss, they're going to look good and they're going to be excited that you help them. And you know, what takes up the most time in your day? What's been repeatedly discussed at stand-ups or all company meetings by senior management? And you know, what are those things? And then really listen to what they, they say is, is their, their pain point. And then that will help you to craft your message. So if you know your audience and you know what uh, their drivers are, then you can craft your message a lot better that's going to be specific to them rather than um, you know, adding too much information or giving them, them too much or giving them not what they're really looking for. Great example of that is when I was doing my Lean Six Sigma training, uh, we'd have to do it in Boston. We did it over five weeks, over, over four months. And every week we would come back, we had to do a five minute executive presentation on our project to, to kind of say, you know, where is it at in the demand stage and where, you know, what are we doing and that stuff. And then we would get feedback from the class on our presentation skills and all of that sort of stuff. And, I, and we had a five minute uh, setup and that was it. Once you, you hit one minute, you got a little bit of a bell ring to say you had a minute left. Once you got uh, to the five minute mark, they gave you like a, a sort of two bell ring. And if you got past, then she would basically just keep ringing the bell until you stopped. Um, and I remember one gentleman came up and he wanted to, to present his message and he got to the five minute and he hadn't even gotten past two slides and he still had 10 more slides to go. Uh, and his first two slides were filled with so many graphs, it was like an eye chart. You could hardly even see what was even in there. So she rang the bell, rang the bell, and rang the bell, and finally he, and he didn't really want to stop, so she finally went up and turned the projector off, and he was quite upset, and she said, and he said, well, you know, I have all this great information, I have all the stuff that my team has done, I want to share all of this information, I want to tell them, you know, look at, look at what we've done, and she said, yes, that's great, but you lost them after the first two slides because you got so deep into the, into the information, you got so much extra information in there that an executive team that, you know, five minutes is very precious to them and they want a high level overview, 
they've already checked out. So we really need to make sure that we're crafting that message. So keep, you know, less is more, keep it simple. You know, provide detail later if you want, you can add more information, you can have an appendix at the end. But if you're providing that information, provide what's needed that's gonna move that message rather than a whole bunch of information at once. Uh, like I said, watch the use of graphs. You know, we love to, I love to make graphs. I, you know, uh, Minitab is one of the greatest things I've ever, I've ever used, but you have to watch the use of them and, and not make too many, especially if you're gonna be posting them or putting them into uh, work cells or working with people where English is a second language. The, the easier the graph, the simpler, uh, the better you're going to get. Okay, I uh, use their language, not yours. So you know, we throw a lot of stuff around. We talk about, you know, we have our own sort of terminology that we use in the quality management field and that sort of stuff. That's great. But if your audience doesn't know that, it's just extra information, and you may have to spend time just educating them on that information. Or worse, you get sidetracked as people get off and don't know what you're talking about and don't know what that concept is, and then you got to explain it. And your message starts getting garbled and, and people lose that message. Um, it's hard to believe with, with um, spell check and that sort of stuff, but spelling does count. Um, you know, if you're going to do presentations, you're going to present stuff to people, you're going to send emails out, spell check. Uh, math is in the other part. Uh, we all have Excel, we all have calculators. I think they were saying in uh, our, and basically we sent a man to the moon with, uh, you know, the level of a typical calculator, yet we don't use it that much. We really need to kind of understand uh you know make that double check triple check your math make sure things are correct um because i find it's one of the easiest ways for people to kind of this uh not disrespect your your uh, idea but kind of dismiss your idea if you know your math is incorrect or you've pulled the wrong numbers or you're looking at the wrong thing uh it's easy for people to kind of say well gee you know if you don't have that information down then then how accurate can i can i believe that is and then presentation skills would be one of the biggest, obviously, if you can practice, 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 you know, um, join ASQ, do one of these webinars, do one in person, practice in front of your family, practice in front of the mirror, whatever you need to do, but but be comfortable being able to talk. Practicing will also help you kind of get past some of that nervousness, maybe highlight some things that you think might be questions people might ask, so you're not kind of asked off the fly and you're, and you're not sure how to answer it. Uh, and plan for it. I think that's one of the biggest ones. Take the time, you know, put your presentation together, put your ideas together, uh, read it, reread it, you know, sleep on it for a night, whatever you need to do. Um, but plan that message and make sure that message is, is well crafted so that people will pay attention to it. All right. So because we got a bit of time, 85% of your financial success is due to your personality and ability to communicate, negotiate, and lead. Shockingly, only 15% is due to technical knowledge, and that comes from the Carnegie Institute of Technology. And I think, you know, this is maybe geared more towards sales, but I think it really is true. You know, people want to listen to your message. People are listening to you. People are listening to your ability to negotiate and lead. Your technical ability, while dazzling, isn't going to get you where you want to, to go and, and aren't going to necessarily drive people and may turn people away. Uh, so you really need to, to balance that out and really uh, understand how, how best to communicate. All right, so let's look at creating great teams. Um, just with the time that we've got left, I want to give you guys a couple of little uh, things that you can try with your teams or as icebreakers or things like that. Uh, I love, really love this one. Uh, the team together, everyone annoys me. Uh, I'm sure we've all been in teams and meetings that are like that. So, uh, but uh, you know, the goal is to get those teams together. When you're getting people together, a lot of times I find in the quality management field and you know, in case improvement and things like that, we're doing a lot of cross uh, departmental teams. Uh, we may not be co-located. We may be talking to people across Canada, the U.S., the world. So we need to kind of find ways to make sure our teams are performing well. So um, there are some things that I think teams really need, and I think as leaders or facilitators, um, we sometimes forget that, but they need a clearly defined purpose and goals that serve the organization. So, you know, one of the things that is a hot button for me is people sending a meeting notice and just that says meeting, and that's it. And I have no idea why we're meeting. I have no idea what our goal is. I have no idea why we're, we're coming together. So we need to really get teams together and say, you know, the purpose of us coming together is that we want to reduce this by 5%. That will lead directly to our organization's goal of reducing the time to the customer or whatever. But at least people can go, okay, I understand what our goal is. I understand why we're here. 
Uh, clearly defined boundaries, especially including time. I think sometimes when you get into meetings and people kind of say, well, we'll, we'll work on this and we'll get it done. And that's just that's like, great. But, but how long? You know, we're all busy. We all have time. We all have to work. Um, so if you can include time and say, you know, we want to have it done in three months or it's a 30 day project or, you know, this is the kind of time frame expected, then it helps people to kind of understand and, and commit and say, OK, I understand where that boundary is. It's that never ending story of a, of a meeting or, or a team event or a case improvement project, then you're going to have a harder time getting people to get that buy in. Uh, ways to communicate within the organization. So who's going to communicate? How are you going to communicate that information out? Uh, you know, do you have sort of team roles or do you have somebody who's the leader? Do you have a sponsor? How is all that going to work so that you guys can stay together? And not just within uh, the communication in that sense, but where are you storing information and, and data? One of the things that, that is difficult for me is I work in Vancouver, our head offices in Toronto, or our international head offices in Boston. And, you know, we set up these team meetings. People go, okay, well, I'll just dump it in the drive and then we can all access the drive. And I virtually put my hand up and say, I can't. I'm in Vancouver. I don't. I'm not connected to your drive. You need to put it on something that that we can communicate, and I can see information and and, and access it. So you need to kind of think of that. People with necessary knowledge and skills, kind of an no-brainer, but but it is there, and and this kind of leads into what we're looking at. Sometimes we assume we just get people together. They all have the right skills. They all have the right knowledge, but because they work for the company or they're they're representing this area. But we really need to be kind of somewhat critical about that and really understand, you know, what, what are the people bringing? How can we make sure we've got a good balanced team for what we're trying to do uh, and make sure we have the right people with the right skills without making it a, a, a 40 team meeting? And methods for doing the work. I think this is something else that we kind of forget. Uh, you know, I like Lean Six Sigma because you follow the demand process and that sort of stuff. Um, but if you give a team a, a set expectation, say, you know, this is step one, this is step two, this is step three, or we follow the demand, or we, we do this, then people have a better understanding, and you can also measure the progress and say, you know, we should be at this by this month, and, you know, we're behind, or we're ahead schedule, or things like that. But if you provide them with some method and some direction, you, your meeting's going to go away, and your team's going to work a lot better, because then they have some structure behind them. If you just say, yeah, we'll get together, we'll we'll work on it, and then, you know, we'll figure it out afterwards in the next meeting. Well, you're not going to have a method and people are going to say, well, what's their direction? So when we're selecting team members, there's lots of different uh, ways you can use to sort of quantify those team members, kind of get some ideas of what they're like. Uh, you can look at resumes or LinkedIn or performance records, depending on what you have access to. Uh, that will give you, again, a sense of your audience, a sense of maybe their key drivers, what's important to them, what excites them. Uh, there's a ton of personality team dynamic assessments out there. Some are free, some are not. Some companies do them. Um, but they definitely have some value behind them. Uh, at Staples, I will say we do a lot of those. Uh, I think I've done every single one under the sun, which is which is fine. I'm, I'm a big fan of know yourself, know others, so I, I really like taking those. Um, but if you can find some of those assessments, do them. Uh, they're definitely worth doing because they'll give you an insight into yourself and they'll give you an insight into your team. Uh, Myers-Briggs is probably the biggest one where you've got the, you know, a couple of different ways that you can get set in, extroverted, introverted, sensitive, intuitive, thinking, feeling, judging, perceiving. Uh, you take the, that, that information and you do that, uh, and it'll give you your, your Myers-Briggs type uh, and your team. Uh, the other one I really like, which folks may not be as familiar with, is the Belbin team roles. Uh, this one I really like because it's about teams. Uh, the Briggs uh, one is kind of a personality test. The Bellman team role is about you as a team. Uh, and that's a really exciting one because you rate yourself and then you send the same survey to uh, up to eight people, I think, that you work with in teams. And then they rate you based on how they see you in a team. And I think that's really valuable because that uh, kind of gives you that insight on a team level and how the team sees you. Um, you know, great information just from what, when I did mine. I did mine, I thought uh, I would be what we call a plant, which is an idea generator. Um, and I did that and I was like, yep, that's the way I see myself. That's the way I see myself in that role as a team. Sent it off to my team, my boss, all that sort of stuff. They came back and said, nope, Dave, that's not even close to how we see you. We don't see you as the idea generator. We see you as the coordinator. We see you as the one who moves the pieces, keeps us moving in the right direction, gets us done and gets us in the right way. Total disconnect from what I thought I was versus what they thought I was. So that Belbin team role I find is a really good one. 
Uh, there's disk profiling. There's the KISA factors analysis one. I uh, haven't uh, done those in a while, but uh, those are also some of the other ones. And I'll just tell you a quick funny story about Myers-Briggs type indicator. Uh, I had a new boss and not with us anymore, but uh, when we, we got her, uh, she was an interesting dynamic, shall we say, that, that brought into our team. Uh, and she had us do the Myers-Briggs indicator, which I think was a great thing because it would give her an insight into how her team operates. And I don't know if you've ever seen them out there, but there's a million and one sort of, you know, Myers-Briggs um, uh, indicator charts. You know, what type of character are you from Lord of the Rings? What type of character are you from Star Trek, Doctor Who, like all of those ones? So she did that and sent us a Star Wars one to see what we would be, what, how we would connect with the sort of Star Wars characters. I'm a big comic book and, and science fiction nerd, so I thought that was pretty cool. So I did mine, and I came out as an INFP, which is um, how it gets broken out, and I came out as Luke Skywalker. Yeah, I'm happy with that. That's all right. I like Luke Skywalker. Uh, and I thought this was fairly accurate to what uh, I was. I, I really felt like what it said was really good. So she had sent that out. I found out what she was. She, she sent that information. I don't know if she's not a Star Wars fan. I don't know if she did it as a bit of humor. She didn't have a lot of humor, so I don't think so. Uh, but I think you can probably guess what her character came out as uh, Star Wars, Darth Vader. So as we know, Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker never really got along that well, uh, but we really kind of had a bit of a chuckle on that. Uh, and again, really matched up with the way she was. Unfortunate it was Darth Vader, but uh, it was quite an interesting kind of analysis uh, for us to have uh, and a little bit of fun that, that's not bad either. So one thing that you can do when you're getting teams together, this is an informal preference survey. It's a great icebreaker you can do when you get your team first together, but it gives you some nice insight into your team. Five questions, very simple, very easy. Get them to kind of fill this out, uh, and you can get a sense of how they like to solve problems. So you can get a sense, you know, what's my mix of my team like? So it just asks them to rate these from one to four, put their numbers in here, uh, total them up, and it'll tell them what type of problem solving person they are. I found even for a simple five question thing is pretty accurate. Most people who've done it say, yeah, that's pretty close. That's, that's kind of me. Um, and what it helps you learn is uh, one of the four problem solving styles. So there's the diplomat who learns best from talking to those involved. There's the professor who seeks lots of historical background information. There's the detective interested in finding the cause of the problem. And then there's a champion who's interested in results. So this can give you a good mix to see who's on my team and what's their, their problem solving style. So if I have a professor, one of the ladies that reports to me in Ontario, she's a professor. She needs to know the historical background information of everything. She needs to get all of the data, all of the information, spend some time getting that, get all that, then she can make a decision, then she can move on. That's great because I'm more of a champion type person. I, I just want to jump in and solve the problem. So she kind of pulls me back a little bit and says, whoa, 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 Dave, we haven't looked at this, we haven't looked at this. And I pull her back a bit when she goes, Dave, we haven't looked at this, 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 this. And I said, no, 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 no. We can look at the first three or four, then we can move ahead. So then that gets her comfortable, gets me comfortable. But if you have a team then you've done this and you find that your team is all professors, you're going to have a hard time moving that team forward. Or if you have a team that's all champions, they're all going to want to have their own way of solving this problem. They're all going to want to just jump in and get it done. They're not going to want to look at the, the detail. Uh, if you have detectives, they might be taking too much time looking into the detail, figuring things out. If you have diplomats, they might be too distracted. They want to talk to so-and-so. They want to talk to so-and-so. Or, you know, we're doing this, this continuous improvement project in customer care. Gee, we better bring in somebody from finance. We better bring somebody in from the credit department. We better bring somebody in from operations. We better bring somebody in from this. Cause we need to talk to everybody and figure out, you know, what they're doing. So if you, you have a better understanding of this, it's going to help you get your team a little bit closer. And very simple, very easy, and I use it as an icebreaker and, and gets a bit of a, a chat and a bit of a, a fun conversation at the beginning. So a lot of times our teams come together for brainstorming and innovation. That's one of the big things. I think all teams are, are and companies are looking for innovation and, and new things. But that can be hard, too, because brainstorming and innovation can fail due to that team mix, depending on how people you have in there depending on what they're looking for, uh, it can be challenging. And I think the next line is, is somewhat important because not everyone can or should be an idea generator. Not everybody's gonna be the idea person. Not everybody is comfortable being put on the spot to figure out ideas. 
Um, so a lot of times you can bring different people. And I found a book that kind of shows that there are four different types of gen idea generators. There's the creators who are happy to do that. They like to create opportunities, create ideas, but they don't want to follow through on that. But they're the guys that will be there. They'll have 50 ideas before they've even walked in the door. Um, they don't want to do any of them, but they have all of these ideas, and they'll help spark more ideas. And, and I had an old boss that was like that. She would come up with great ideas, tell me, and I'd be like, I don't know how we're going to do that, but let's see if we can figure that out. And then she'd be on to the next thing. Um, but we need people like those. Connectors, uh, they're the ones that link those ideas to solutions. So they're the ones that hear all these ideas from the creator and go, ooh, ooh, that's a good one. We could take that. We could do this with it. We could put this into here. Okay. Developers are the next ones who look at that and go, yeah, then we could take it. And here's how we would practically put it into our business. Here's how we would provide it in there. And then doers are the ones that say, you know what, I'm not interested in figuring out the ideas, but you give me that and I'll run with it. And I'll get it done on time and on task for you. So, uh, you know, these are all the people we need in creating ideas and creating brainstorming and creating innovation. So there is a nice uh, another chart you can use again as a bit of an icebreaker to kind of get an understanding of your team and kind of find out, you know, where do they fit? What type of um, idea generator or what kind of innovation person are they? How do they think? And again, that will give you that insight into your team. If you've got a whole bunch of people who are developers, it's going to be hard to come up with new ideas. If you've got a whole bunch of creators on your team, it's going to, you're going to have lots of great ideas, but nobody's going to want to do them. Okay. So this is a great easy one. Same thing, just marking one to four, what you like best, what you like least, total them up, and it'll give you an answer to uh, where you're at. Another one that you can find that I got from a great book from Finding Your Innovation Sweet Spot. Uh, is to look at systematic innovative thinking. And sometimes people want, oh, let's just think of new ideas, you know, outside of the box, all that sort of stuff. Systematic is thinking inside of the box and looking at ways that you are already dealing with stuff and saying, can we do subtraction, multiplication, division, task unification, attribute dependency. It's a more analytical way and it can sometimes help with folks who are a little more analytical and less sort of freewheeling on ideas. So we look at Subtraction as an idea, you are removing components from a product. So taking a uh, DVD player and making it a slimline DVD player. Okay? That's a still innovative. That's something new. Multiplication, alter an existing component. So how could we alter what we've already got? Well, in the case of disposable razors, you move to multiple razors. Somebody came up with that idea and said, hey, why don't we add another razor? And somebody else came up and went crazy. And I think now we've got razors with like 10 blades on it, I think now. So uh, I think they've kind of mind that as far as they can go but but you maybe an alter an existing component division uh reconfiguring of existing parts okay so when i was younger stereos came in they were one piece and that was it and uh when you people move to sort of the component there so you can mix and match you split them up you can get these speakers you get this receiver you can get this and you get that uh task unification you can assign additional tasks to an existing component so we see that in cars all the time combining a defroster with a rear view mirror. Okay, so for a lot of cars, when you have uh, you hit the defrost button, your, your rear view mirror is defrost also. And attribute dependency is complex, but addresses the relationship between the product and its environment. Okay, so this allows you to do something with uh, your product and how it interacts with the environment. The easiest one with that is glasses that have that photochromatic lens that darken in the sunlight, and then when you go inside, they uh, lighten up so you can see inside. So you know, these can be ways that your team can look at things in a different perspective, especially if you've got a team of more analytical thinkers that aren't necessarily excited to sit there and just come up with new ideas. It may be a way to look and say, well, what are we, what are we already doing and how can we do that differently? Still innovation. Uh, ground rules, I think, is one of the big ones that a lot of teams don't do, but I think is really important. Uh, if you create ground rules at the first meeting, it's essential. I take one of those big uh, sticky uh, notes, put it on the wall, or use a whiteboard, and ask what the ground rules of our team are going to be. You know, what are going to be our do's and don'ts? What are going to be our med meeting etiquette? No phones, show up on time, do your tasks. And the other big thing is decision making. How are we going to make decisions if the team gets stuck? Are we going to do it by consensus? We're just going to vote. Is it going to be my majority? We're going to do it by expert or leader. We're going to bring the boss in and say, hey, boss, we've got these three options. We can't agree on it. What do you think? And he goes, just pick this one. Great. We'll go with that one. So I think that helps because decision making sometimes gets difficult or you sometimes get into power plays where people want to make the decision rather than coming up with a way at the beginning to say, this is how we make these decisions. 
and then develop what we call parking lot or the Elmo, not the little Muppet, but it's uh, one called Enough, Let's Move On, where ideas come up, they get your team sidetracked, you can say, let's put it in the parking lot, let's write it down on a post-it note, stick it on the side, we'll look at it after the meeting. It validates the idea, lets the person know their idea was heard, but doesn't distract the team from the rest of the meeting. And then you can go back to that afterwards and uh, deal with it. So the ground rules, I think, are really important. They really help your team get focused, and you, it helps you as a facilitator to go back when your team is unfocused and say, hey, 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 these are our ground rules. This is what we said we were going to do. Let's make sure we're sticking to this. These are the do's and don'ts we're going to do in our meeting. Uh, challenges to successful teams, uh, remote and virtual teams, we've talked about that, the lack of ground rules. Improperly balanced teams don't help. Uh, the loudest voice in the room or not getting that consensus. So if you've got that person who uh, dominates the, the conversation and everybody just goes, oh, let's just do what they're saying, that can help with the ground rules where you say, no, it's a consensus. We all need to vote on that. Uh, lack of advanced planning and that unclear goals and timetable, not providing people with minutes, not providing people with an idea of how long it's going to take, what are our goals, what are we trying to accomplish. That's what's going to help, or that's what's going to turn your team into this lovely event that's happening right here. <laughs> uh, some team conflict you might want to look at. Uh, active listening is always important, okay? except what an individual is saying, the right to say it, offer an understanding. But don't give unsolicited advice, just understanding, okay, I see what you're saying, let's see where we can go from there. It helps reduce the defensiveness, it's going to build rapport and trust, and it's going to help people focus on the problem solving, not on the dynamics. Uh, some typical issues, you got your dominant personality, lack of participation, all of those sorts of things, uh, distracting technology, it's hard to get people off of their phones, a little bit of pessimism sometimes in meetings, why are we here, what are we doing this for? Those ground rules can help because it, it, the team is making those ground rules. It's not you, it's, it's everybody. Everybody's participating, everybody's agreeing that this is how our team is gonna, gonna react and act. Uh, deal with the conflict in a positive constructive professional manager may be hard. We'll talk about emotional intelligence in a couple of slides. Uh, and that's where you really have to have that emotional intelligence to say, you know, uh, how do I not escalate the situation? Uh, evaluate your teams in relationship to their goals. Uh, I find one of the things we don't do is reward our teams enough. I think we need to do a little bit more of that. Uh, even management recognition, I think, helps. When your team has done something good, you know, get your, your management level one above to, to send an email to everybody or stop by and say, great job, everybody. I heard you hit this milestone. Or, you know, all of those things make a difference. Uh, company recognition. Uh, Staples Business Advantage is an all Canada call every month and our president calls out all the condition proven projects that we've done and the benefit we've seen and the people involved in them. So that helps recognize the people and gets other people excited to be part of the team too. Uh, part of their performance appraisals, that's always nice to add something in there, completed this, you know, can help with them in their performance reviews, token of appreciation, uh, something called gain sharing. Don't see that as much, but it's basically where the team gets a percentage of the benefit that they did for uh, the company. So if you saved a couple of thousand dollars, um, you know, the, the team would get a percentage of that. So, yeah. well, hopefully this has come back. There was, so it's experiencing some difficulties. Uh, the four stages of team development. Uh, just a quick uh, one on that. Um, you may have heard of that, developed by Bruce Tuckman. Still works where your team, no matter how many times they come together, they still go through these four categories of forming, storming, norming, and performing. Performing is where we want to get to, but uh, we need to get through the rest of them first when a team comes together. Forming is that exploration period. The teams are coming together. They're exploring what's acceptable. They're usually somewhat non-committal, even though they may have been, uh, I like to say, voluntold that they have to be part of the team. Um, there's a lot of questions that get raised. You know, do I want to be part of the team? What's expected? Will it be accepted? What are the rules? Who's the leader? Is the leader competent? So if they understand, and if you state and understand the purpose, identify some roles, establish ground rules, all of that is going to help them to get through that forming stage better. They're going to really understand what's really happening. Storming, there might be a bit of competition. Competitions are going to be around power, leadership, decision making. No, I think we should do this. No, I think we should do this. No, I think we should do that. Uh, it cannot be avoided. You're going to have some of that because you've got people together. We're, we're people. We're, we're going to have a little bit of that. 
the leader is going to be a bit uh, tested. You know, how well do you handle this? How well is our team performing? How do you handle these things? They're going to seek, you know, how do they seek their autonomy? How much control can they have? Maybe they're going to try to want to influence the, the uh, team to go to help them rather than the, the team goal. So you really need to understand you know, how can we get them to be a little more controlled and less towards that storming. So it really develops that leader, really understanding your team, understanding that people will help you get your message across and you move them in the right direction. Uh, when they get into norming, they realize they have common interests. The two teamwork begins. They appreciate those differences. Uh, they work and problem solve better together. And some of the questions are what kind of relations can we develop? Will we be successful? How do we measure up to other teams? What's my relationship to the team leader? All of those are things that are going to be coming up as they hit the norming. And just be aware that team members may withhold good ideas for fear of reintroducing conflict. They may say, well, we're finally working as a team. I'm not sure this is going to work, but I don't want to say anything because we're doing so well. So you really need as a leader to encourage them, no, you know, keep telling us information, keep, keep providing those ideas, tell us if we're, we're moving in the right direction. And then when you get to performing, that's the results. Okay? They can define tasks, they can work their success, relationship successfully without going to the, the team leader. They manage their own conflicts, the little bit that there might be. They work together to accomplish their mission. And the leader kind of can take a bit of step back and can direct and support without having to actually um, move them and and get them going in the right direction. You can just direct and support them because they're performing where they need to be. So there is a sequence. They, they do move through those four stages in sequence, but they may revert back if new members or you lose a member, change in the scope or the business needs, uh, unresolved team conflicts. So if you as a team leader don't resolve the conflicts, people may be in the, the norming stage and then take a step back because that, that conflict hasn't been resolved. Uh, or if there's the general lack of skill, if somebody's not uh, having the right information or your team mix is incorrect, that can, can make things more challenging or make moving through that, the four sequences a lot slower. Uh, so lots of information you can do to help uh, the team move from one area to the next. Uh, since I'm going to send this slide out, you guys can take a look at it afterwards. Um, but realize your teams do go through this no matter how many times your team has come together they may go through it faster to get to performing but be aware as a leader and as a facilitator that you know this is happening to your team at all times managing your remote teams we see that a lot more often more chance of multitasking people clacking away on the um on the uh, computers or, or the phone, or they're talking to somebody. Uh, so it, there's a lot more multitasking. But if you provide information in advance, especially login information, get people to test it, agendas, minutes, tasks, uh, use cloud-based storage like we talked about so people can have access, engage everyone in the room, uh, go to meeting, WebEx, they have polls, they have brainstorming, you can break out rooms. There's lots of ways to get people to be engaged. And if you assign roles, it can also get folks more engaged. Okay, you're going to be the timekeeper. You're going to be doing the minutes this time. You're going to be doing this this time. Uh, people will get more engaged rather than just sitting there uh, listening to, to somebody talking. Uh, I thought this was kind of funny. It's been making the rounds of LinkedIn over the last little while, and I thought this was pretty cool. Conference call bingo. I think we've all seen this uh, when we join into a conference call. Uh, and I would encourage uh, maybe to try that next time. I think it's kind of a, a funny little one to, to do um, and have some fun with. But uh, we've all seen uh, this information on those conference calls. And then last is emotional intelligence. Um, you know, this is becoming a big one that's out there now, uh, true leaders and, and getting them to be understand self-awareness, social awareness, self-management, and social skills. How, how do they involve those? and how do they be uh, uh, help them become better leaders. So, you know, you've got listening better. I think it's a big one. Engage listening. Really listen to people. Don't listen so that you can talk next. Listen and, and really try to understand what they're trying to tell you. Acknowledge your own weaknesses and say, you know what, I, I realize I'm not the best with that. So like I said, I, I'm a big proponent of know yourself, know others. Take some of those surveys that, that tell you about your personality type. See what your team thinks. If you do a 360 degree review, but be, be comfortable and, and, and supportive enough of yourself to be able to accept what those information is going to be. Uh, understand your hot buttons, those things that really push your buttons. If you understand those, you have a better way of dealing with it, uh, especially in a team meeting. So if you can be calm and when somebody hits that hot button, you're going to have a lot better chance with your team to make a better impression. Uh, and get your team moving forward than if you panic or, or get uh, worked up or, or get emotional 
uh, over that uh, hot button that somebody pushes. And show your vulnerability a little bit. Tell, tell stories. Say, you know, show that you're relatable. Say, tell people a little bit about yourself, uh, things that you've done wrong, maybe you know, fails that you've had. People can relate to that, and people can go, "Oh, this person's just like me." They're they're not, uh, you know, they're not trying to be better. They're not trying to, to to solve everything. You can show a little bit of your vulnerability there. And this is a good chart to show. You know, sort of the low emotional intelligence versus the high emotional intelligence and, and kind of some of those personality traits that people are looking for and that good leaders display. All right, and that's uh, it. A little bit longer than I expected, but uh, we still have a little bit of time. But, uh, yeah, feel free to uh, contact me on LinkedIn or send me an email. I'm more than willing to chat. One thing I like about quality management professionals, we really uh, seem to like the network. We really seem to be open with a lot of our ideas and a lot of sharing. So uh, I'm definitely that way. Uh, if you've got any ideas or thoughts or, or any questions, uh, feel free to touch base with me at, at any time, and I'm more than happy to have a chat with you. But thank wow, you very thank much, everybody. Yep, thank you, David. That uh, was very informative. Uh, we do have a few minutes left here uh, before the top of the hour. If anybody has a question for David, uh, please use the chat box. Uh, he'll be happy to answer questions. And while we're waiting, uh, just want to do a quick reminder that our next webinar will be on Monday, September the 11th. Uh, it will be Maximizing Your Minutes uh, with Jennifer Campfield, who's the Director of Talent Development at James Madison University. So uh, several folks have registered for that already, but there's still plenty of uh, space available. Uh, so hopefully we'll see some of you online uh, in a couple of weeks. So someone was just asking about, uh, you know, how do you pull people from the floor to attend training? What are some things that can be done to promote quality training? It, it is challenging, but I think you do, you do have to find the driver of the, the person who is on the, uh, who's, who's owning those people to kind of understand, you know, what, what can I do to show them that it's there? Can you also reduce the training? I've done that a little bit to say, you know, I'd like an hour, but can I get a half an hour? Or can we do it out on the floor? Or can we do it in bits and pieces out on the floor. But I've, I've had uh, folks in, the, in the, the past in the warehouse, especially for ISO audits, uh, that I've had to kind of get them in and, and do some training. And I, and I tell them, you know, if you bring them in, we can see them do their job better. You get less customer complaints. You get less sales reps calling you. Uh, you know, your, your CSAT scores are going to improve. And then also they go, oh, all right, yeah, we can spare a bit of time and, and let these guys kind of get involved with it. So you really do have to find that, that driver um, you know, it's, you've got to find out what's going to get them to be excited about having that quality training. Just saying you have to, to have it or, you know, it's going to improve things in general, that's great, or it's going to meet our goals. But what goals, what specifically to them is, is going to help them and make them say, oh, okay, I need to give them some time. Yeah. I hope that, that answers the question. Yeah. Uh, does anybody else have questions for David? I'm checking the chat box. <laughs> yeah, bring donuts is always good. I call uh, in Canada, we call uh, the uh, Canadian peace uh, offering is a Tim Horton double double, which is a coffee with double cream and double sugar. Uh, I didn't see that one. That must have come through just to you. <laughs> yeah, it just says bring donuts to meeting is always helpful. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's funny. It's funny because when I was talking about the gentleman I did the 5S with, that's what I did. Is I brought him actually a Tim Hortons coffee, which was good and bad because he knew I wanted something because I was bringing him something. So. <laughs> Any other questions or? I'm not seeing any other questions coming to the chat box. It uh, looks like we've had a few folks to drop off, which, you know, is possible because of meetings possibly coming up at 1 o'clock. Sure. Uh, it does not look like we're going to get any more questions. I guess if anybody does have a question, they can contact you, uh, like you said, either through LinkedIn or through uh, your email. 
Yes, for sure. Yeah, uh, like I said, I have no no issue uh, letting folks uh, uh, asking questions or, or helping as best I can, for sure. Yep. Okay. And uh, we'll be sharing your uh, PDF of your slides uh, with everybody, too, that was online uh, today. Um, how do we register for the next webinar? I will get with that individual here. I'll send I'll send him an email. Um, you can see uh, our registration links uh, are on our section website. Uh, we can also um, send uh, out an, we also send out event flyers too, and we will also have that information out on our LinkedIn group. So. Uh, different ways to register, uh, but I'll follow up with that individual uh, after we go offline here. It uh, looks like we're not going to get any other questions, David. Uh, I'd like to thank you once again uh, for giving this talk today. Uh, it was very informative, very information packed, uh, lots of gold nuggets, and uh, uh, and we'd also like to take time to thank everybody else who joined us online today. And we look forward to seeing uh, some of you on uh, September 11th. And uh, if, you're in the, if you're in the United States, uh, also uh, happy Labor Day and uh, enjoy the long holiday weekend and uh, have a good rest of the day. Thanks, for Great, thanks everybody. Bye now. Talk to you later. Bye.